in the 60s, Nigeria still had a reasonable expectation of federal schools, universities. Uh, the mail system, um, public transportation. I've been looking at pictures of Lagos from the 50s and 60s. I mean, what a lovely place. You, know? you just want to be there, you know. It's you see 11th Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. UTC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Lagos was a, a young city that was coming into, into its own. But what happened is that the leadership continued stealing, and that mindset of being a crook just started going down to everyone. So that the way Nigerians narrate the problem with the country is that, ah, our leaders are crooks. Unfortunately, that narration doesn't work anymore. We're all crooks. We all have to take shortcuts. We sort of tolerate it. And we also feel like we get to the point where we're so frustrated by then, they had already subverted local systems of rule. Uh, the kings of Lagos were against the slave trade. British ships came to help and quickly took over the nation and started using it as an extractive industry and then started to move into the hinterland and forcibly pacifying um, ethnic groups. Um, so that's what we're left with in 1960, a country that was designed around plunder. Yeah. And then, you know, the people that were put there were like, well, well this has been made rather convenient. You know, there's no true federalism, there's no true oversight. And, you know, our, our very genuine difficulty is, is such an extreme level of diversity yeah. in that country, which could be a strength, yeah. but it's not because we don't feel as if we have common cause. And I think one of the things any nation has to do is find a way of narrating itself. A, a, a country does not exist out there. You don't go buy one, you know? Yeah. A country has to be imagined. Okay. America has to imagine itself into a country. A bunch of white people came over on the boat and, you know, they all, fleeing something does not make you a country. You had to imagine that space. You had to come up with documents. You had to decide who to oppress, who to suppress, who to get rid of by genocide. <laughs> what story to tell about yourself and that's why Americans are so insistent about their story right mm -hmm. and some parts of it are beautiful I mean, yeah, and some yeah. parts of it are horrific so Nigeria's failure to give itself a story about itself <coughs> except when we're playing football in the world Cup. Wow. <laughs> that's the only thing that makes sense so we need to actually find a story that makes <coughs> sense for us as a nation so that it's not all oh, those house of people over there, those Yoruba people, yeah. like, those Igbos, you know, those are those and so that's the one thing that I that stood out for me upon mm -hmm. just reading the book as a whole, I really mm -hmm. like the yeah. fact that you gave this narrator mm -hmm. a possibility to kind of worship two yeah. masters in the sense that he was a psychiatrist or trained to be a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And he also has a love for the art yes. as yeah. a whole. Yeah. So it's like a lot of people always yeah. don't seem they seem like those two things are Kind of like yeah, to be a professional in one thing yeah. and to be serious about the humanities serious. in another. It's yeah. always kind of like oil and water to the to the masses as a well. whole. Yeah. And I also noticed too that um, in I started reading your book with Mister Yeah, the the character was also is it similar? Is it the same? It's not the it's not the same. It's not the same, but I can address that in more detail. He's also uh, focusing on psychiatry mm -hmm. too. Like yeah. so, my question is kind of two part. Is it like I noticed you have a fascination or per se for for psychiatry? Yeah. Is that something that... Well, I'll, I'll tell you that real quick. I'm a medical school dropout, and I wanted to be a psychiatrist. I see. So, this is like parallel alternative worlds in which, you know... So who is this narrator for real? Right. <laughs> that's... <laughs> 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 the proof comes out. <laughs> My mother is German. <laughs> how much portion of that, yeah, how much portion of that, right, of that narrator, would you say it's... Would you, is it safe to say like it's almost semi-fictionalized in the sense that it's you want a me memoir? To quantify it? No. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, the fact is that this is a fictional character. This is a fictional character. He doesn't speak for you in any song. <laughs> he doesn't speak for me, and it's important to understand that because the biographical facts, in any case, are different. The conflicts with his parents and all of that, where he comes from, but also a lot of the attitudes. And I think part of the reason we write fiction is in order to explore other modes of being. Sometimes radically, so I could like do like a, whatever. My character could be like my narrative could be like a transgender Chinese, uh, you know, person. Or it could be a young 
man close in age to me who's also lived in Nigeria, who lives in New York, and bring him close in that trivial way, but then have the gap between us be. And I like the tension when the when the gap is a little bit smaller, so that I can explore it in a way that to me as a creative person feels a bit more dangerous. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are people in this room who have even more in common with him than I have in common with him. I just want to explore a gap that wasn't a very big one. That's all. Um, just out of curiosity, you know, how did the, your photographs make their way into the novel? Was it um, sort of serendipitous or yeah. was it um, planned or, you know, just sort of two things coming together? Yeah. And uh, the other question I had was about your uh, phrase in the novel about uh, Lagos being the happiest place on earth, or the people there being yeah. the happiest place on earth. And it was, you were actually talking about Middle America just a minute ago, it was reminding me of how, um, like in Utah, you know, it's like this place where people are, where it's very sort of authoritarian and people are very regimentedly yeah. happy, yes. yet it's also a place where they have like apparently a very high rate of antidepressant use. Uh, and I sort of return to this question of, you know, the happiness. The way it's narrated in Every Day for the Thief by this guy, he sort of fits it into his sort of very melancholy view, which is like, you know, he's, he's just pissed off. It's like, you know, happiest people my black ass, you know, he's <laughs> really upset. Um, but I have like, I think I, for me personally, it's slightly more nuanced view of it, which is that a lot of Nigerians are happy in a way. They have access to a kind of joy and presence with each other. People at parties are really happy I and mean, they're having a good time. We we know how to chill out and hang out and have a good time. And I think when I go to Nigeria and I come back here and I feel pe I feel people are really uptight here, you know, and people are pinched faces on a Monday morning and there's a way in which Nigerians are happy. That's one thing. But Nigerians are also very unhappy. Like seriously unhappy. They're very unhappy with the way the country is. They are unhappy with how much trouble it takes to get simple things done. And so it just brings us to this zones of complexity, complexity where many different things can be true at the same time. There was another poll of late where um, it was a poll about dissatisfaction among youth. And Nigeria had the most dissatisfied youth. So how do you square all those things together? And you know, a lot of it just sort of, I mean, whoever is sticking, you know, um, statistics here, you know, it's very hard to set up a poll and, you know, question as bias and, you know, what do exactly the words mean and what do the people who are answering the poll think it means. Mm -hmm. I've noticed, for example, that many Nigerians won't say, I'm unhappy, even, if, even when they are. That's true. <coughs> a lot of, like, many Nigerians will say, it is well. Yeah, you know, like God will take oh, care of it. You know, yeah. or like to say to say I am unhappy, and it's legit coming from where the way they think about the world. To say that you're unhappy is giving in and showing lack of faith. Like the malaria case. Right, right in the book, right. I mean, but but if you have, but you know, if you have, you know, somebody who's really unhappy, and everything around them is saying it is wrong to even admit that you're unhappy then that starts to create other kinds of mental distress, yeah. mm -hmm. you know. So there's a lot of me undiagnosed mental illness in Nigeria, mm -hmm. you know, because people are not even allowed to tell a story about what they're going through. Speaking to that also, the fact that you published this book originally in Nigeria, which I didn't yeah. realize yeah. initially, like how did that come to be and yeah. what did that mean to you? Well, I mean, I think it was one of those situations where the statement of a story becomes part of the solution to that problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, the statement of a, a conflict becomes one of the ways in which we start to emerge out of it. Mm -hmm. So this text was seen by a Nigerian publisher, a young Nigerian publisher called Kasava Republic, who wanted to start a new wave of fiction for the Nigerian market. And they convinced me that, look, we can do it do right. And they did it right, you know. They did a wonderful job with it. and. By Nigerian standards, but for like a no-name, you know, uh, publisher, you spend that. They probably they probably sold seven thousand copies of this in Nigeria, you know. Um, so and then they had lots of other books, and then there's Farafina publishers who also do, you know, Nigerian books. They do Kuchimamanda's books, for example. 
This, I made a visit to Nigeria in 2005. My narrator hadn't been back in 15 years. I hadn't been back in 11 years. More distance from the narrative. A little bit of distance, <laughs> you know, just little, little things like that. Um, I went in 2005, I wrote this book in 2006. It was published in 2007. In the space since 2005 and now, there are a large number of new Nigerian books about contemporary Nigeria. There are all kinds of young people writing online and interacting with each other online. There's like a whole wave of young people in their teens and their 20s saying, I want to be a writer. In part because of Helen Habila and Chris Abani and Chimamanda and Gozi Adichie and Sefi Atta and me. They're like, oh, this is actually something you can do. I could never have thought because I knew uh, Chino Achebe and I knew Wale Shoyinka. These are old dudes, they're crazy anyway. Like, <laughs> <laughs> young Nigerians see me on Twitter, they interact with me, they're like, this guy is actually writing for a living. This is what he does. And, and so uh, I can see our, our dreams have shifted. Now I go to Lagos, and, and since that 2005 trip, I've been to Lagos eight times. Mm -hmm. I go to Lagos, and I meet young people who say, and I say, you know, what are you doing? And I say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. A film? What? what? How? <laughs> like, you're a young Nigerian living in Lagos, you've never left, and your dream is to become a composer, a filmmaker, a novelist. And so, the, that frustration is still there. But now there are book clubs, there's literary festivals, you know, there's spaces. There are people who believe that this, uh, there's writing workshops. None of this stuff really existed 10 years ago. And we're going to end all those other people as well. Yeah, this is, <laughs> if, if, I, if I get it right, this is the book club to end all people. <laughs> that, 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 that ended. That ended. Ah, it's futuristic. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that.